I guess we'll get started. Uh, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're, we're recording this, this event, so if uh, you don't have to identify yourself, the event's going to be recorded and, and mounted on our website so people who couldn't be with us tonight can, can listen. So if you want to just use your first name or no name at all or, or uh, call yourself something else, that's fine with us. Um, anyway, tonight's uh, guest speaker is Frank Zinatelli. Uh, Frank is the Vice President and General Counsel for the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association, otherwise known as the CLHIA. Um, he's going to talk to us about um, risk assessment by life and health insurers, um, the industry's position on genetic testing, and um, something that I'm really excited about, and that is their recent uh, drug pooling initiative, which I'm sure he'll go into a lot more detail uh, about. Um, I think a lot of, there's probably two uh two categories of people on on this call um some who um are are receiving treatment um namely prolastin um which is being funded by their their private insurance and of course then those who uh um whose private insurance won't cover it so as I understand it, all the life and health insurers uh, in Canada belong to the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association, and uh, obviously um, they have different policies. But but Frank's going to kind of give us an overview of uh, how the life and health insurance industry works, and especially with respect to people with uh, genetic uh, diseases like L1 antitrypsin deficiency. So I'm going to pass it on to Frank. He's going to talk for about half an hour, and then we'll have another half hour where we can ask questions. So, Frank, thank you very much for joining us tonight, and uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Jim. I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, to chat with you and, and uh, members of your, uh, of your group. Um, I just want to say that, uh, indeed, CLHI represents, you know, over 99%. I'm not sure that we're at 100%, but uh, certainly over 99% of life and health insurers uh, carrying on business uh, in Canada. I'm going to discuss uh, what you just listed, Jim, um, you know, but I'm going to start first with uh, just describing uh, the types of insurance products that are out there. Uh, just to, to put it in a little bit in, in, in context, okay? I'll, I'll do that uh, uh, pretty quickly. And then I'll move on to discuss underwriting and uh, the industry's position on genetic testing and the recent drug pooling initiative, as you've uh, suggested. So um, I'm talking about, we're talking about life and health insurers, and of course we can distinguish this from uh, uh, the property insurance, which would be, in, you know, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, um, and, and that sort of thing, general liability insurers. Uh, life and health in insurers uh, are, offers products that are intended to provide financial security to the, to the policyholder and, and his or her family from events such as sickness, accidents, disability, or death. And the type of products that you would find provided by uh, life and health insurers are, well, life insurance, um, as we've just talked about. We, we also provide pensions and annuities, uh, disability income insurance, um, uh, critical illness insurance, which, for example, provides benefits if uh, an insured person contracts specific illnesses. Um, we also have health care insurance and dental care insurance, and, uh, and, and, uh, and we offer all of these uh, products um, either uh, on a group basis or on an individual basis, okay? So, so that's the kinds of, of, of insurance that there are out there. Another distinction that I'd like to make is that uh, these products can be offered either uh, – from the public sector, so there are public sector programs, or from the private sector, okay? So let me tell you about the public sector, again, very briefly. Um, these are, these are uh, programs that uh, respond to the specific needs and are offered to the general population, so these apply to everybody. They're usually in the form of um, 
uh, pensions or, or other benefits such as life or disability insurance that is paid to a surviving spouse. And I'm talking here about uh, old age security, employment insurance, um, provincial health insurance, and uh, these are all things that are offered through the public system. Okay. Now, in all of the public types of insurance that are out there, an individual doesn't have any choice regarding what the coverage is going to be or what the benefit level is going to be. That's determined by, by the government for you. Now, I represent the other part, uh, and that is private sector insurance. In the private sector, um, life insurance, for example, usually consists of financial protection that takes the form of a lump sum amount paid to the family um, of, of, of an individual that, uh, that, may, uh, that, that will, will die at some point. I guess we all do that. Um, at the end of 2010, um, the average amount of life insurance per person was 173700 and uh, there were almost 21 million Canadians that have uh, life insurance uh, at, as of that date. And that represents about three-quarters of, of Canadian households. So uh, we, have, we have, as I said, two types of insurance, individual insurance and group insurance. Let me talk about group insurance because we'll come back to this uh, later on. Uh, in the context of the drug pooling. But group insurance is usually, uh, usually corresponds to uh, group life insurance, usually corresponds to about one year's salary. And the cost of this um, and, other, uh, and other protections, such as health protections, is usually, uh, or often I should say, not usually, often shared uh, with the uh, employer. So the individual pays some and the employer pays uh, the, the, the other. What is important here to understand is that in group insurance program, there is no requirement for evidence of insurability, okay? If you work for somebody, for, for an, an employer and the employer has a plan, then you know, anybody that is covered by that plan gets the same, uh, the same benefits. Um, so, so how is it determined what what a, a group insurance plan is going to pay. Well, what determines that is the experience of the whole group, not of a particular individual. So you don't look at the specific characteristics of the employee. You just look at what the, what the, uh, uh, what risk the whole group uh, represents. Uh, so if, uh, and, and if an employee leaves the group for your information, uh, and with respect to life insurance, they, they can actually get private coverage within 30 days of, of leaving. Um, and um, so, so that's something that, you know, that might be of interest to you. So we've talked about group insurance. Let's move on now to individual insurance. Note that I have stated that with group insurance, what determines the risk is the experience of the group. Well, in the case of individual insurance, you have to look at the, the, uh, the risk that the particular individual uh, brings to the table. Let's talk about life insurance in this context for a second. I just want to note that in the case of life insurance, once you purchase life insurance and you have it, okay, you've, uh, you've been underwritten, you've been offered insurance, then, as long as you keep paying the premiums, as long as you do that, the insurer cannot cancel that protection. So when an insurer is offering somebody life insurance or is assessing whether to offer somebody life insurance, they have to think forward 40 years, 50 years, you know, 60 years, depending on, on, on how long the, the person lives. And they have that one shot, that one opportunity to make the, the risk assessment. So, so that is, I think, just something that I wanted to, to, to focus on. 
So the, an individual, so, so in, in group insurance, you basically get the coverage that the employer offers you. When you're talking about individual insurance, there are a wide variety of choices that, that you can uh, obtain that is offered to you. Uh, you select, um, you know, you select, uh, you know, whether to buy it, first of all, whether you're going to use an agent to get that insurance, what type of insurance you want, the amount, you know, uh, that, that you want coverage for, uh, the term for the insurance. Do you want it for, you know, for one year because you have a short-term need or do you want it, you know, for, the, for, for life? You know, those are choices uh, that, that an individual makes. And providing such choices requires the insurer to assess and classify the insurance risk on that individual basis and to a greater extent than when such choices are not provided, such in the group uh, context. So now I'm going to get a little bit technical, uh, I, I suppose. I'm going to talk about the pooling of risks. And the pooling of risk is a really a fundamental aspect in the design of uh, uh, of insurance products. Um, insurers group individual risks with other comparable risk profiles. The insurer is not uh, assigning a specific probability to that, to that individual, but that individual is a representative of a broader group. Okay. So, for example, um, if if an insurer assigns a higher prob probability of premature death to a smoker than a non-smoker, all right, the insurer is not predicting that the smoker will die before the non-smoker, only that the survival rate will be higher among the group of non-smokers. So the premium level uh, of each individual is determined based on the level of risk to the pool to which the individual is assigned in order for each individual to pay their fair share of, of the cost that is being uh, brought to, to the pool, to the pool, I'm sorry. So that's, you know, that's what kind of makes ins insurance fair because if, you know, if, uh, if an insurer wants to insure, um, you know, if, if, a, if, a young, if a young fellow, 20 years old, say, uh, applies for insurance, and then I apply for insurance, and I, I'm not going to tell you my age, but I'm an older person, uh, then, uh, as you can expect, the, in, the insurer will charge more to me than they would to the young fellow, everything else, uh, everything else uh, being, being equal, because the young fellow is going to say, well, I don't want to subsidize that old guy, okay, because he brings a different risk uh, to the table. And so in classifying risks, the, uh, the insurance company will look at a variety of, of uh, criteria, such as age, sex, medical profile, the physical attributes of the person, family history, occupation, so all, uh, you know, a number of factors. And uh, to determine the risk fairly, the insurer must be knowledgeable of the circumstances of the specific case. And then it uses that data uh, and, you know, looks for data that are sufficient and reliable to, to make the, the call, the determination as, uh, as to uh, whether to offer the insurance or not. Now, just want to add as well that the, how thorough the assessment is varies with the basis of how much insurance is being uh, uh, applied for, just because you have to make sure what level of risk is being brought to the, to the pool. As much as possible, insurers try to use a streamlined approach because uh, that costs less, and to do a really detailed uh, underwriting is a very, you know, it, it can be, can be uh, ex expensive. The other thing that I want to really stress is that insurers want to sell insurance. That's what they're there for. You know, it is a business where it is a business, and therefore you want to sell the product in order to, to at the end of the day, make that the profit, if possible, for your, uh, uh, for your shareholders. Now, 
I should note that over 95% uh, of individuals are insurer, insurable, uh, generally. Um, and the overall percentage of these are insured at standard rates. And, um, and, but there are, in a minority of cases, there, are, there is a minority of, of cases where insurance cannot be offered at this time uh, because insurers can't adequately price uh, for the risk. Now, I, I just want to give you a little bit of, uh, of history on that in the sense that if you went back, say, uh, say 30 years or, or, or 20 years, or, or you, know, you would find that uh, uh, some conditions that were not insurable then are insurable now. And I'm thinking about, for example, people that have kidney transplants or diabetes, uh, many types of cancers, etc. cetera. So, uh, so, so uh, generally, uh, there seems to be an evolution in insurers' risk analyses. And uh, again, uh, insurers are kind of pushing boundaries uh, to, to, to try to insure, to insure. Um, and, and uh, to do that on the basis of, uh, of price, price competition, um, because, again, they, their objective is to be able to sell uh, insurance policies. So um, I should note that, uh, again, I reiterate that uh, once insurance is sold, or uh, then uh, because particular life insurance, for example, uh, because this lasts for, for, for the rest of your life or as long as the person uh, c continues to pay the premium, an insurer cannot go back and, and change that assessment. You know, you, you, you offer the insurance and then you, you, you stay with it for as long as premiums are paid over uh, many, many years. Um, there are also um, in insurance laws that you know, set out a fundamental principle that life insurance contracts are contracts of utmost good faith. Utmost good faith. And uh, so before committing to share a risk, the insurer must have all the information that the applicant has available that is material to the risk. So what does material risk mean? It means that if the, ins if the insurer had known Okay, if that risk had been known, uh, then the insurer would have acted differently with respect to that application for, for insurance, perhaps by asking for additional information uh, or maybe offering, uh, uh, you know, offering the insurance at, at an increased premium or, in, as I said, in a minority of cases by declining to accept uh, the risk. Now, I'm going to move on. So I've talked about risk quite a bit because it is kind of fundamental to, to what the uh, industry does. But I want to move on, oh my gosh, because uh, I notice that time is, uh, is, is uh, fleeting. I want to talk about the industry's position on genetic testing. Basically, the key part of, uh, of our policy is that insurers will not require an applicant for insurance to undergo genetic testing, okay? However, if an individual has had genetic testing done and the information is available, you know, so, so there is a test, there is the information, then the insurer would request access to, to, that, uh, to that information, just as it would for other information, as I've noted above, age, sex, the applicant's uh, medical uh, history. Uh, and this is because this is to address something called anti-selection. And what anti-selection is, is when uh, there is a disproportionate number of, uh, of individuals which have a higher mortality or morbidity risk which apply for insurance. So if a person knows that they have a risk, okay, they will apply to try to get, to, 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 to try to obtain insurance. The, if the insurer does not know about that risk, uh, they might, you know, they might consider, they might assess and offer the insurance. But then there is this person with a higher risk that got the insurance. But then 
as I said, that insurer lasts forever uh, as long as premiums are paid. So when a new person applies, because the cost to the insurer would be higher be, uh, because of that higher risk, somebody else that might be of a lower risk would have to pay more to subsidize the person that has been accepted with the higher risk. So, uh, so that's, what, uh, that's what this concept of anti-selection is about. Um, I just want to note that any genetic information that is collected by the insurer uh, would be used in conjunction with other health I information. Uh, and, it, you know, it could also, it, to establish a proper risk assessment, and, of course, depending on, on, on the condition and the situation, it can be used to offset or confirm uh, information that is available from other sources. So in some contexts, you know, some genetic tests are, can be favorable because on the basis of family history, you might think somebody has a condition, but the genetic test indicates that, you know, that, it, that it, they don't. Um, and of course, um, I can uh, let me indicate that any information, including genetic information, is treated by the industry with utmost uh, confidence. Uh, it is uh, treated in accordance with the privacy laws that it, that exist uh, um, across uh, Canada and beyond that, because uh, the the industry actually was the first group uh, that to put into place uh, in uh, in privacy in, in guidelines for the industry back in 1981 before there was there before there were privacy laws in uh, in Canada I'm just going to mention finally that the information that insurers use to assess uh, any risks has to be sound and relevant and uh, and insurers have medical officers within uh, within the companies uh, to help them to make those assessments, or they rely on reinsurers, which help them uh, to, to ensure that they are uh, only using reliable um, information, including medical information. Okay, so uh, I just want to move on to the pooling, uh, because I notice, again, what the time is. So recently, the industry has developed a, uh, uh, a pooling initiative. We've been working on this for about the last three years, and it is to address the growing problem of the high cost of catastrophic drugs. And in that context, the sustainability of group drug plans, okay, because the prices, the cost, of, uh, of drugs um, generally, but also in the context of, of group plans, uh, has been increasing at a rate of 9.4% 9. 9. annual growth, which is really not sustainable. It is um, uh, far exceeding the overall level of inflation in Canada. So the issue is with the very high cost and and recurring costs, okay? It used to be that many years ago, some of the medications that are now available, or, or sorry, some of the medications uh, were, were, were in often for, uh, for older persons. Nowadays, we find that relatively young people can, can uh, you know, can use uh, certain drug therapies and, uh, be, you know, uh, be, Completely productive if they uh, if they have access to these to these drugs. Uh, but you know, so so what happens is that if a person is young and the and the cost of the drug uh, is high, then of course that can can be uh, can it would be recurring every year, and uh, so you can see that the cost would add up over uh, over the years, and um, and the and what the industry has noted is that the growth in the number of high-cost claims has exceeded 20% uh, the, per year since at least 2008. So the cost is increasing. And when I say high, high cost, I'm talking about over, over $25,000 uh, 
And indeed, there are, I understand there's at least one drug for a specific condition that costs over a million, over a million dollars per year. So it can be really significant. And uh, as you may know, group health insurance and group drug insurance, these are annual contracts. They're renewable annually. Unlike the individual insurance, uh, which we were talking about earlier, where once you purchase it, it's kind of for life, okay? Because remember, you have more choice there, etc. So those are for life. But group insurance is renewable annually. So when the, when the group plan comes up for renewal, the insurer looks at the experience for the past, for the past year and then determines what the new cost, you know, what the cost would be for the, for the following year. And if there are very high drug, uh, drug costs um, or, or, or high claims, then the cost, of course, for the subsequent year would need to be higher. So if you're an employer and you're trying to keep costs low, if you go out to, uh, to shop around for another insurer to, to, uh, to take over the drug plan, they're going to look at that experience as well, and they're going to charge a higher a higher amount. So with, with the higher drug costs, it makes it more difficult even to switch uh, insurers for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for, for an employer. And I just want to go back to a basic thing. We haven't really, we talked about insurance, but I haven't said what insurance is. And I just want to give you a definition of that. Insurance is a contract to provide financial protection against unanticipated loss. And I want to stress unanticipated, okay? And, but what's happening here? Well, here, you know, it's, if you have an employee which has a recurring drug claims, well, it's, it's anticipated, isn't it? So like, it, it sort of doesn't fit even within what insurance is supposed to be about. But employers, of course, want to provide uh, group benefits. It's also, you know, it's one of the, one of the tools they use to recruit, recruit uh, good employees. But how to address this high cost? So uh, these recurring catastrophic claims in, in, in many instances. Um, so what the industry has determined is that we would like uh, employers to continue to, to uh, provide uh, drug protection, and uh, and what uh, uh, and what the industry has done is uh, it has come up with this plan, which is essentially uh, a, sh a pooling of risks, uh, so that all the insurers across Canada that provide group group uh, group insurance. Uh, uh, have gotten together and they have said that if an, in, if an employer, okay, if an employer has a recurring drug claim, which initially has to be over 50000 uh, for the first two years, but then it can be as low as 25000 that's per individual, okay, or per, per certificate, then th th all the insurance companies will share the cost between that $25,000 and $400,000 per year, okay? So the, the cost would be shared amongst all the providers of this uh, insurance. Now, I should note that um, for any particular claim, um, the, the pool will only cover 85% of, the, of, 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 that, of that cost, okay, above $25,000. So what that means is that because the cap is at 400000 so what that means is that you could have a drug for about $500,000, and because, you know, the first 25 is not covered, uh, has to be covered by the, by the insurer, that's, that, the insurer that, that has offered the plan, and because the coverage is for 85%, that means that, um, that, that, the cost of any one claim can be about 500000 but, again, the coverage would be for 400000 uh, of that. This applies to fully insured plans, and uh, all the insurance companies in Canada that offer uh, group benefits are members of this, uh, of this plan. Um, uh, a, um, 
a separate legal entity company has been formed to actually administer the plan. So, uh, so that's and, and it's starting next year. So this is very, very recent. Again, it applies to fully insured plans. Um, and that's, I think, where I'll stop with respect to pooling. Just uh, to finally wrap up my, my, my remarks, I just want to note that insurance, just to go back to our prior discussion, is a, is a very competitive market. It's important to shop around. Uh, different companies will apply, uh, you know, different risk assessments to pay, uh, uh, sorry, the same risk assessments, but different companies would be willing or similar risk assessments, but the companies would be, some companies are willing to take more risk than others. So it pays to shop around to different companies when you are looking for coverage. Um, and perhaps, Jim, I will stop there because I have perhaps been rambling on a little bit, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe we can open it up and have a discussion about um, the three topics which I have discussed, which is insurance underwriting, uh, genetic, the position of the industry on genetic testing, and our initiative on uh, on the drug pooling. And, uh, yes, thank, thank you. Question. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, so I'll just, I mean, we'll just open it up. Uh, if people have questions. Uh, I have a question. Uh, fire away, just try not to talk over top of each other. For sure. Can I ask a question, Jim? It's regarding the new initiative beginning next year on the cap? Yep. Uh, Frank, would mm -hmm. this cap commence in 2013? That's right. It, it, taking perspective of what's happened in the last five years on any particular uh, client, or is it... Actually, I think, I think it goes back, and I, I, and I stand to be corrected because I'm not an expert on this, you know, on the plan, but I think uh, to determine... Uh, for example, whether you fall into that initial, because you have to meet the test of 50,000 at yeah. first, right? Uh, um, uh, 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 an individual has to have a, a cost, a, a, uh, a drug that costs 50, over 50,000 per year for two consecutive years to be eligible for the, for the pooling. But then once you meet that initial threshold, then, you know, if that, Fifty thousand falls to, down to twenty-five thousand. Coverage would continue, but so in assessing this fifty thousand, I think they go back a year or two, but I don't think they go back further than that, uh, just because uh, uh, you know, in order to have the, 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 the necess necessary data, it may not have been collected in, in a specific way, etc. So I think it goes back a, one or two years to, to determine uh, where the threshold begins. Okay. So I don't if know you if met that threshold properly. in the past and it was in excess of five years ago, then it still wouldn't hold any credence. No, it's it's basically going forward, right? I see. Because okay. the pool is just starting now. I see. The industry pool is just starting now. Uh -huh. So it just looks, you know, in order to see, you know, in order to get started, the idea is to uh, to bring into the pool these catastrophic uh, recurring uh, drug drug uh, uh, payments, right? Yes. Yeah. So the so the, the 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 agreement was, I mean, below fifty thousand, the initial insurer is just responsible for it, right? Yeah. But but then to for there to be a re recouping, to, for it to be included in the pool, so that everybody contributes to the payment, you know, it has, as I said, it has to be. Over fifty thousand for the first for, for at least two years. Okay, mm -hmm. so once then you're in the pool, if the cost goes below fifty thousand to, uh, to you know to to as low as twenty five thousand, you still stay in the pool so that the cost is shared amongst uh, amongst all the insurers. Mm -hmm. You know. So can, I, in, can I just in, add in, one in, other in, thing in, that I may not have mentioned in my in my remarks, which I think is important. What this does for a for an employer who has a group benefit plan in place is that when the when the year is over and they want to shop around to see if if uh, 
if, if another insurer will offer a better deal, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, what would happen is that, let's say, the other insurer sees the experience and says, oh, my gosh, there's, there's, there's an individual there with a $200,000. You don't know which individual, but you know that there is an individual. Right. With a $200,000 uh, drug claim, which is going to be recurring, right? Right. So now, with the pool, because over 25000 it's going to be paid by the pool. Right. Okay? That insurer that's, that's, that's considering offering a, a, to replace the, the, current, the current insurer doesn't have to consider that 175000 right? Right. Because that's covered by the pool. So they are more, they're more likely, it, it, it's more competitive for, uh, for an employer to continue to provide group benefits because the insurance industry is covering those big amounts for catastrophic claims, and the employer can kind of, you know, um, I guess Feel confident. buy with relief a little bit because what, you know, consider, I mean, uh, what does an employer do? You know, take, for, for example, mid-sized or small employers that are offering a group plan, okay, and they have these, these high, you know, one individual with high drug costs. You can see them thinking, oh, my God, how can I, oh, sorry, oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> how can I address that particular situation, you know, and, and you can see them thinking, well, gee, I wish that person didn't work here or that kind of stuff, right? Well, yeah, or if you had insurance on a police department or a fire department and 20% of your employees have cancer from their job, yeah. you have high costs. Yeah. And yeah. for us personally, we have high costs. Yeah. So when you talk about bringing in a threshold and having it commence next year and you share privacy and information. No, we don't share individual information, okay? We oh. don't share individual information. You, what, what you do, what an insurer would see, like if you're in, like insurer A as the, as the, uh, as the plan, right? right. As the group plan now. Okay? Right. Then the employer says, uh, you know, the end of the year comes and of course because the contracts are renewable, they say, oh geez, we're paying, uh, I don't know, whatever. London Life. Well, yeah, I mean, okay, so London, uh, so, so London Life has it. But as the, the contract, and then the employer X says, gee, maybe I can get a better deal. Right. Let me shop it around to Great West Life or right. Annual Life right. or, um, or, you know, or, or some other or Royal, uh, Royal Bank Insurance yeah. or whoever, right? Uh, let me shop it around. So then these other companies, not London Life, they would know what the costs have been, but they wouldn't know whose costs. Yeah, okay? I get it. Because that's you know because privacy legislation protects uh, protects um, the, you know that kind of information from being right. shared. Right. Yeah. So, well, that's good. So yeah, so I just wanted to to reassure you on that. Yeah. Well, that's where I was leading. Yeah. No, I think uh, um, uh, with respect to privacy, uh, you you will find, and I'd be I could talk quite at length. Uh, about the protections that are that are in place, and I just touched on it earlier in the sense that we have historically uh, been very sensitive to to privacy concerns that individuals have. And uh, as I noted, we were the first uh, 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 group in Canada to bring in privacy guidelines back when people didn't think about those things okay. back in uh, 1980 or 81. I, I forget the exact date. But I just want to note something else about the drug pooling program. Mm-hmm. Notice that I said earlier that there are some drugs that recurring drugs that cost over a million dollars. Okay. Right. Right. And I also said that we we cover like the cap is four hundred thousand, right? Right. And that's because you know we're, we're, we we hope that at some point kind of government will join in on some of those other higher costs because really some of those issues are really societal societal issues. You know we're trying to do our bit as an industry. But you know some of you know the, the the issue of high drug costs and how to address uh, uh, some of those are really societal issues. So uh, you know, so I think that the the pooling 
helps. I think, you know, it's, it's a great step forward, but there will still be some instances above that, you know, 400,000 where, uh, you know, there will be some portion that would not be covered for, co for, for high cost drugs that are above that amount. And uh, what we understand is that there will be a lot more new types of drugs that are really, really expensive. So this, I think, is a continuing issue, but I think uh, the, the, the industry drug pool, uh, personally, I think is, is a, a really great initiative to, to, to help address uh, uh, the, the issue, um, to, to create the discussion, and to, and to hopefully, at some point, bring uh, government on board to address some of those much higher uh, specific drugs. Is there any past precedents that have been set by the industry to push the government to taking more responsibility? Um, well, uh, there are there are um, protections that we have in other areas. I, I there there has been a drug pool, for example, in Quebec for a number of years. Um, that that does the same sort of thing and uh, uh, or, or a similar thing, except that was uh, after that was a government mandated one. Okay, so the government was very uh, interested in doing that and um, you know uh, and passed legislation many many years ago. And and this kind of this our our plan is a private initiative, and of course. We as an industry have to be very concerned when we work together on, on anything that affects pricing because uh, of, of the uh, Competition Act. And so we're, you know, we, we were very careful. We actually sought opinions from the Competition Bureau, et cetera, to ensure that we could, that we could do something like this together. Uh, otherwise, it would have been faster to do. But, uh, but, you know, we have to take care of that as well. Okay, because, as you know, competition laws, you know, are there to promote competition. And when you're, when you, and in this case, of course, we have to share some of the costs of, you know, we're sharing some of that cost, right? Mm -hmm. And and so we have to be very careful about competition issues in this regard. And but we satisfied ourselves that we were on the right side and that this was a, a proper and and good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Hi, Frank. Is it, it's, it's Jim. Um, one thing that, that that we've noticed is that you know different different insurers and, and I guess even different plans yeah. um, cover different things. Yeah. So that there are people. In fact, I know there are people on this call, for example, whose whose treatment and the treatment for alpha one costs about a hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Uh, is being paid by a private insurance company. Yeah. There are other people on this call who have private insurance. But yep. that company uh, refuses to pay for this particular treatment. Yep. Um, when, when insurers sort of make those decisions about what's sort of on their formulary or not on their formulary, mm -hmm. yep. um, where, where do they look for guidance? I mean, do they look at provincial drug plan formularies, for example, like if you know if the Ontario government pays for yeah. it? In or, fact, I think you know. Compared to some of the drug, the government plans, uh, private plans, or many of them cover a lot more, actually. Okay, but yeah, I mean they take into consideration what's on those, what is on those form formularies. Insurers want to cover as broad a group as possible, and I'm consistent with uh, with the idea that you know insurers are there to to provide a service, right? So the the broader the service, the better it is for the for the insurers part because they get paid for it. But of course, the employer is the is is in the case of group plans, uh, the ultimate decider or de de uh, yeah decider is a good word uh, of, of what it will be covered. So there are discussions between the uh, uh, the insurers and the uh, uh, the group provider, the group sponsor. Um, but ultimately, it's the uh, uh, it's the group plan. That makes that determination. So, because so there will be different costs depending on what you cover. Right. So, so that's basically what it comes down to. So, I mean, an insurer can say, well, you know, most plans do this, or, or the government does, you know, covers this, etc. 
So, that, so that, that will, you know, and they might then look for, for option one, you're going to have this coverage um, and this cost. If you go for option two, you know, you're going to have a different list, you know, if you just look at, at drugs and, and, uh, and this cost. And then, all, and then the uh, uh, the in, in the, the individual group plan decides. That's that's how it works. It's a it's a market thing. So um, shopping around by both you know by both uh, uh, the group plan um, uh, and right. individual. In the case of individual insurance, is really important. So 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 it is possible, for example, for. Uh, an employer to go to their insurer and say, "Look, you know, this—I mean, this is just too expensive. I can't afford it. Um, how can I get my premiums down?" And the insurance company can say, "Well, you could stop covering certain treatments, um, especially uh, this one that one of your employees is currently getting that costs a hundred thousand dollars a year." So uh, that is, I mean, I can imagine that possible discussions, you know, could, could occur in that regard. Certainly cost discussions would be because the employer might say, I can only afford, uh, you know, 500000 uh for, for paying for my plan this year. Right. That's, you know, so, so let's make a call. Are we going to uh, eliminate life in, the life insurance aspect, the drug aspect, the dental, you know, what, where do we, where do we, how do we make it leaner? So that that would explain why, for example, some people might be getting their treatment paid for by Sun Life, yeah. while other people who are covered by Sun Life under a different plan aren't getting their treatment paid yeah, for. Yeah, that would so be, it would be part of that uh, negotiation. Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, I mean, and this is this is the thing with the we you know the drug pooling. I mean, the driver is just the cost. You know. And uh, it's it's uh, and and because uh, the expectation is that those costs will will continue to go up, right? Because the the in, the insurance industry has been concerned for the last number of years about this issue, and um, you know, but they used to be kind of one, more one-off kind of uh, situations, but now you know they're more uh, they the the drug costs are. Uh, you know, catastrophic, large, large amounts, and they're recurring. So, so as time passes, it seems that the cost issue is just becoming more extreme. And so that was one of the drivers for the industry to to try to um, come to to some conclusion as to how we could help to to uh, uh, to ensure that well, the drug benefits would continue to be offered by employers. Right, because one of the options, of course, for the employer is to say, "I'm just not going to cover drugs," or "I'm, you know, I'm just going to cover, you know, what the government formulary is." As I said, you know, compared to to the government formulary, often, uh, if not always, I, I don't know if I can say always. I'm not sure about that, but often, the uh, the uh, private private uh, plans cover more than uh, than the drug uh, than the government ones. Yeah. Okay. And some of them cover the same. So you know, if that's the if that's the if that's the the, the yardstick that uh, that an employer and an insurer want to use, you know, say, well, we'll cover what the government plan would cover. Right. Uh, are there and, any and other it questions? No, it just varies. Are there any other questions out there? Um, yes, I have one, um, Frank. Under a group plan that covers life, disability, and an extended health drug plan, um, if an individual is approved for a disability claim under that group plan, can the employer cut off the extended health portion while you're still under your disability claim is open? So sorry, so you have a, I see, I see. So you're saying, uh, the employee is on you have, so, so you're, you're on disability and then the employer cuts off the or reduces, I guess, the benefits in that situation that you're saying for everybody, right? Um, it would be for everybody, so it's right? For, it's for the individual. That oh, well, you mean they, they would make it available for, the, for, for, for everybody else but not for that person? Right. Uh, so it's, not a, it's not a change. But I'd have, to, I'd, have to, I'd have to check on that 
And if you'd like, Jim has my email address, and if you want to ask that specific question, I can research that for you. Oh, great. Thank okay, you. I, I just don't know, uh, I, or at least I don't know with certainty, and I, and I wouldn't want to give wrong information. So if there are any specific questions, uh, you know, specific general questions, because, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll take fact situations sort of thing, I'd be happy to, 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 to look for the proper answer for you. Yeah, that would be great, or even any direction that we could, you know, get the documentation on that. Would be As I said, Jim has my email address, and uh, and and, um, uh, and and I'd be happy to to look at those questions great. and try to get you the correct response. Okay. Yeah. So I I know I've, I went over a lot in the in the first part of of. Uh, of this, um, and, and sometimes insurance can be uh, can be a little bit complicated at first. And I was a I was new to it at some point. And I said, "Oh my gosh!" But then, uh, ultimately, you know, it, when you work through it, it does make sense. And uh, there is, you know, it, there is a rationale. There is uh, uh, the, the risk assessment uh, that is done um, is is, uh, is a very logical logical approach that was determined many, many years ago and continues to be valid today. So, uh, and, and I just want to offer, Jim, and, and those of you that are on the phone, just as a, you know, on that specific question, if, if, uh, if people want to follow up with me now or, or in, you know, in the months to come, if they have any questions relating to, uh, to, to life and health insurance uh, that they're interested in, uh, in, in, in getting an answer to, uh, I'd be happy to get the question. I won't always know the answer, but uh, I can reach out to people that probably would know the answer. That's good well, that's, to know. Uh, that, that's wonderful. Thank you. Certainly, we'd love to to have the ask the ask expert on our newsletter or our sure. website, Frank. That would be <laughs> that would be wonderful. Sure, as I say, I'd be happy to, to you know, to try to assist, and uh, that's sort of my job to be, you know, to to to, to do that. Uh, I try to assist my members, and I try to assist uh, uh, in, in groups like your, yourselves and individuals that have questions about insurance, because uh, um, one of the one of the important things on this and on many other subjects, you, you will have heard, um, you know, t this month is Financial Literacy Month, but I guess uh, from my perspective, it's Insurance Literacy Month, and, uh, but that's kind of 12 months a year for me. But, uh, uh, but you know, we, we need to get – the more people understand about how, the, how insurance works, I think the better it is for, for the individuals that are applying for insurance and, and, for, and for the industry. So, uh, so I think it's a win-win situation to have those types of discussions. Um, Frank, if that segues nicely into my question. Oh, and I should note that my lights just went out, but that's okay. I can still hear you. <laughs> but I'm going to get a flashlight. I can hear you. I'm at the office, okay. and, uh, and the lights just automatically. I know I have a flashlight nearby, though. <laughs> okay, ahead, so the you. question is, as an organization or individuals themselves, do you um, as an organization, ever bring in the public, the general public, to discuss certain matters such as drug pooling and program and genetic discrimination and, you know, pre-existing health conditions? Is there some way as an organization uh, such as ourselves, as rare disease groups, can mm -hmm. speak to insurance companies on a whole and advise them of what is happening to our, our patients in particular? Well, you know, I make myself available for such discussions, as do my colleagues. I have spoken uh, with the representatives of the Coalition Against Genetic Fairness, for example. Mm -hmm. I have offered, uh, I, I have offered uh, not only myself up, but my colleagues up for them to, to you know, to be able to... Uh, uh, to, to, you know, to address any points that they want. Right. We do try to, if you go on our website, we, we try to stimulate discussion on what we consider to be important industry uh, issues. For example, we've just come out with a paper on long-term care, and we have another paper on uh, health care. Uh, we came out with a policy statement, and these are all on our website, on uh, on something called uh, 
un uh, uninsured plans, uh, and, and that relates to uh, the people on long-term disability. Mm -hmm. That um, that you know, long-term disability when it's provided by an insurer is 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 protection like forever. If a person until 65, uh, if a person has a, is on long-term disability, right, mm -hmm. and then their company goes bankrupt, okay, yeah. their employer, if yeah. they're on the disability and it's an insured, right, the insurance company will continue to pay the long-term disability benefits, right, because it's insured. Sure. But there are some situations where the employer says, I'm going to take that risk. I'm going to uh, to continue. I'm going to. So if somebody goes on disability, I and I'm going to say the magic word. We'll continue to pay those people on this on long-term disability, right? But it's their responsibility. And then when Nortel goes bankrupt, people people uh, that were on long-term disability are out in the cold. They don't get their payments anymore because Nortel is bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So we've come out with a policy saying, look, when it's long-term disability, it should always be insured. It really should. Of course. If that makes sense because they would continue to get paid, you know, until mm -hmm. they're five. Um, and, and so, so, sorry, to go back to your question, we do uh, outreach. Uh, we try to speak to, 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 to journalists, for example, that deal with consumer issues. Mm -hmm. We're available to them to answer questions and uh, to provide information on any on issues that they raise with us. So we try to be as um, connected, as available as we can. We also there's also an industry body uh, which is not part of CLHIA, but it's called the Ombud Service for Life and Health Insurance, mm -hmm. and that addresses. Uh, uh, they have people there to know about life and health insurance, and they can answer questions that people have. We also have a variety of booklets here at CLHIA about life insurance and different products, so, so we try to, to educate people. So, it's, it, you know, we try to touch on a number, a, a number of ways that we can communicate with, uh, with uh, consumers and other stakeholders. Well, I don't know if I've maybe uh, quite answered your question, but we try no, to be certainly. as open as you know as we can. I just wanted to make sure that if ever those you know opportunities arise, that you would certainly contact us because I, I'm sure we would um, love to engage in conversations about how we can advocate for our patients. I would one other thing, you know, because of you know I should note to you know to individuals with with your condition um, that you know. As I noted in, in my presentation earlier, I said, you know, things have changed over the years. You know, it used to be that we didn't insure certain things, certain mm -hmm. types of cancers, for example, you know, 20 years ago or what, whatever whatever the time period, um, uh, kidney transplants, that kind of stuff. Well, things are progressing to get, get better. I think that what is really important is that if there are new developments, you know, and, and I know you you, uh, you were indicating earlier in the at the beginning of the call when we were just chatting that you're meeting with uh, an individual that that works in a doctor next month, etc. If there are developments, okay, that you think would change the risk profile, you know, let us know. Let let your insurance company know if you're applying or, or, or an insurance company that you're that you would be applying to, or multiple insurance companies that you would be applying to. Let them know about the most recent you know, helpful information because insurers, as I said, try to sell insurance as much as they can because that's their purpose. So, uh, and, you know, and work with your doctor to present, you know, uh, as, as good a case as possible. You know, provide that information is, would be, you know, so shop around, provide up-to-date information. It, you know, it may help. As I said, there are medical officers within the companies but, you know, they may not have heard. You may hear about a new development from the last couple of months that they may not have heard of yet. So provide the most up-to-date medical information uh, which might help you in obtaining benefits, in, in obtaining the, the insurance that you might be seeking. Anyway, I've rambled on. I'm sorry. Not at all. We so appreciate it. 
Anything else, by the way, I am in the dark, but I'm used to it. I can kind of see the lights outside, and, <laughs> but it's not so bad. Well, Jim, is there, are there any other questions? I, I don't have any. Does anybody else before we uh, let Frank go? Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I guess um, thank you very much, Frank. I, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time and providing us with, us with the information and especially for, you know, uh, undertaking to have a continued relationship with us. That's that's great. Uh, for, for sure, Jim, any time, uh, and, and, and that uh, that's for you and, and for your members as well. Yeah, and and thank you to everybody else who's on the call. Um, it's uh, you know it's it's because because of people like you that that, that we do this and and uh, you know try to as much as we can increase the knowledge base of of the people out there who who have Alpha One or are caregivers for people who have Alpha One or family members. And uh, we really appreciate you showing up and and uh, showing your interest and and. Uh, learning with us more about, in this case, uh, life and health insurance. So once again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Frank, and uh, have a great what's left of the evening, depending on where you live. (laughs) Good night, everyone. Good night. night. Bye-bye.